Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jake, and today I have a challenge for any Jehovah's Witnesses watching this video. It's going to sound pretty easy at first, but stick with me. Jehovah's Witnesses, are your beliefs based in the Bible? Now, I know that sounds easy, but basically every Christian church says that their beliefs are based on the Bible. But like, are they really, or are they based on the Bible in the way that Balto is based on a true story? So, first question, where does the Bible talk about a paradise earth? And I'm talking about the phrase paradise earth here specifically, because if you go into your Watchtower online library and do a search for paradise earth, you'll get a bunch of results. But if you narrow that search to just the Bible, you'll see that there's no results, actually. Well, there's a few. There's a few in the study notes, in the introductions, end notes. So those are things that Watchtower is inserting after the fact, but that phrase, Paradise Earth, which is one of the most common phrases you use as a witness, is not actually in the Bible. Uh, so where do they get that term from exactly? Well, it's interesting. If you look up all of the examples of the word paradise in the Bible, if you look at the reference material that Watchtower provides, almost every instance of it, in fact, all except one, are said to refer to heaven. There's only one proof text that Watchtower uses as a resurrection to a paradise earth, and specifically it's the verse in Luke when Jesus is talking to the other prisoner on the torture stake, and he says, truly I say to you, uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. But that one's kind of weird because Jesus is saying, you will be with me in paradise, and in every other instance it refers to paradise as heaven, but in this instance where Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise, Watchtower says that that's actually a figurative example. But obviously there are several texts in the Old Testament particularly which talk about the meek inheriting the earth. Jesus did talk about God's kingdom coming to earth. So I can see the argumentation for a paradise earth. It's just interesting that that key phrase doesn't actually show up in the Bible. What about the great crowd of other sheep? One of the most common aphorisms for Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, if you search great crowd of other sheep, obviously you'll get a lot of results. But if you go to the Bible, and search that same thing, uh, you will get zero results. Uh, at no point is that phrase in any version of the Bible. See, the great crowd part, uh, that's a thing that was said, and other sheep, uh, that's also a thing that's said in the Bible. Uh, but when you look at it, they've just been kind of combined into one phrase, and Watchtower kind of takes it for granted that this must mean the same thing. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that one of these key things isn't actually in the Bible, but maybe you could do some research and reason as to why it is that they've combined these two phrases and why that's valid. What about this one? This is a really big one, spiritual food. Now, spiritual food is one of the key parts of being a witness. You have the place to go to, which is the source of spiritual food, Watchtower says, right? When you go to the meetings, you get spiritual food. Today, Jehovah invites us to a banquet that is spiritually nourishing. Bible-based videos and publications draw us close to God. and satisfy our hunger for truth. And in fact, they say it was foretold by Jesus that there would be a faithful and discreet slave that would provide spiritual food at the proper time. Today, Jehovah provides direction to the slave through Jesus. Jesus in turn provides direction for his people through the faithful and discreet slave. We can have therefore full confidence in the scriptural insight, understanding, and guidance. But if you look in the Bible, uh, the phrase spiritual food only comes up once, and it is in that instance very specifically referring to the spiritual food that the Israelites had that came from the heavens. Like it was literally spiritually provided food. Watchtower talks about uh, our need for spiritual food a lot, uh, but that doesn't actually say that phrase in the Bible except for the one time when it meant literal manna from heaven. So one of the easiest questions for Jehovah's Witnesses why does God allow suffering? Any witness knows that. That's one of the first things you learn when you come into the religion. That's one of the main reasons that draws people in, is why God allows suffering. And the answer is that in the Garden of Eden, Satan challenged God's sovereignty, his right to rule mankind. His challenge to eat of the forbidden fruit wasn't just for Eve. It was something that all of the angels would have been watching, and it would have posed a challenge. He was saying, essentially, that men have the right to rule themselves. God doesn't have the right to rule over you. And so God let Satan be in charge of this system of things for a while to prove him wrong, to prove that Satan slash mankind's way of ruling is inferior to Jehovah's. So back to the main question. 
where does that scene happen in the Bible? Now, I'm not talking about the challenge to Eve. That definitely happens. I'm also not talking about the scene in Job. Job is something that Watchtower points to a lot to show that Satan has dominion over mankind. As you read this book, pay attention to how this account proves that Jehovah is not the cause of human suffering. How events in the heavens help us to understand the issue of universal sovereignty. And how the outcome of Job's trials gives us a glimpse of future kingdom blessings for those who remain loyal to Jehovah. When he made that challenge that a man will give up everything he owns, uh, that wasn't just specifically talking about Job. He said a man, therefore saying that all men would potentially disown God. And the only reason why Job worshipped him is because God gave him all these amazing things, right? Well, that was one instance with one guy. And even though he may have been referring to the general point that any human being will disown God, well, presumably at that point, he would have already been in control because the drama in the Garden of Eden had already happened. So if that had already happened, and Satan was already the ruler of this system of things, uh, then the challenge was already underway, and he wouldn't have needed to re-pose the challenge to Jehovah, and he also wouldn't have needed to ask permission, right? Because he could have just made Job's life miserable because he's the god of this system of things, so to speak. So where's the scene in the Bible where it's laid out, Jehovah says, Satan, I'm going to turn the keys over to you for a while, uh, and we'll, I'll show you, I'll show you that the way you're doing things is wrong. When Satan challenged Jehovah, millions of angels were watching. How Jehovah handled the rebellion would greatly affect all those angels, and eventually all intelligent creation. Knowing this, Jehovah allowed Satan to rule this world for a time. That scene is not in the Bible, and that's a pretty important one because it's really the foundation upon which all of the building blocks of your faith are built. So is that in the Bible? I, I, don't, I don't see that scene in the Bible. I see a scene where he challenges Eve, and then years and years, hundreds of years later, he challenges Job separately, uh, but I don't see a scene where the keys to the kingdom are turned over, so I don't know. Jesus does say the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one, uh, but he did often use illustrations. He might not have meant that literally. And there wasn't a scene where we literally see God hand over the kingdoms of the earth to Satan. So I don't know. Maybe a witness in the comments can explain how we get from point E to point Z. I started at E. Why did I do that? Last belief. Is the governing body in the Bible? And obviously, if you search governing body in the Bible, narrow your search of the Bible, it won't show up because they're, they're not specifically mentioned. Actually, there will be some results that show up from the study notes and the intro notes. See, the governing body is in the study edition of the New World Translation because the translators have put that phrase in the end notes, but it's not in the actual Bible text. So if you didn't have an existing governing body telling you that there was a governing body in the Bible, uh, but it didn't say that, you just have to kind of look at the way it worked this one time in Acts 15, and if you extrapolate that, you know, we, we're kind of doing that now as Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, is that is that in the Bible? The other challenge I would pose to Jehovah's Witnesses is look at Acts 15. Does the way it works in that chapter reflect the way the organization runs today? Are elders able to be a part of governing body meetings? No, they have some private meeting on every Wednesday in Bethel and uh, nobody's allowed in there. Uh, not elders, certainly. So all of those things are based in the Bible in the sense that there is a scriptural reference, but I think you could agree that Christendom has scriptural references for the Trinity. You know, they have a few verses that they point to where God and the Father are said to be one. They have scriptures, but as witnesses, generally, you like to show them a lot of other examples where the Trinity wouldn't necessarily hold up. Now, what if I told you I am starting a religion, and the key thing about my religion is that we don't let women talk in our congregations. And I'm able to point to a scripture where it says women are to remain silent. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. As a witness, I'm sure you would say, well, let's look at the context. What did Paul mean at that time? Did he necessarily mean that women should be literally silent in the congregation at all times. And I could say, I don't know. It seems pretty black and white to me. I have a belief that is based on the Bible. My larger point is, a lot of groups say that their teachings are based on the Bible and they can point to a verse to support that belief, but does the larger extrapolation of the belief 
come from the Bible, or are there certain assumptions that are being made to bolster an existing belief system? I don't know the answer to that, but I would be really interested to hear, uh, if you're a witness, how you would respond to those things in the comments. I've actually been really interested in talking to a witness on the show. Uh, that has been kind of hard to do, because uh, witnesses aren't really supposed to talk to critics. But if you'll be interested in doing that, by the way, let me know. We can blur your face, change your voice, do everything, uh, and just have a conversation. So I hope that helped you uh, think a little bit. And thanks for watching. Bye.